Live in Western Oregon, this is NBC 16 News at 11. A missing tour helicopter in Hawaii located. Remains have been recovered and according to officials, there are no indication of any survivors. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Filling in for Alan Matthews, I am Alexis Thrower. Melissa Rainey reports. Following an 18 hour search, the wreckage of a missing tour helicopter in Hawaii has finally been located. We had air and ground operations uh, dispatched. Early this morning, we commenced those operations and we were able to positively identify the aircraft involved. One pilot and six passengers were on board. Two of those passengers are believed to be children. The passenger manifest confirms seven individuals were on board the aircraft and we have recovered six sets of remains. The chopper was touring Kauai's Nepali coast Thursday afternoon and according to the Coast Guard, the last communication made was at 4.40 p.m. local time, about 40 minutes before the chopper was scheduled to arrive back. Officials were notified just after 6 p.m. that the chopper had failed to return, launching a multi-agency search. Low visibility and windy conditions made the search that much more challenging. The chopper was reportedly equipped with a locator, but officials were not able to get a signal from it. We'd like to offer our sincerest thoughts and prayers. I would like to reassure the family members and friends of all of those involved that we are sending out as much resources as we possibly can. I'm Melissa Rainey reporting. Just two days after Christmas, a California family is mourning the deaths of three family members. A father and his four and 12 year old daughters died in an early morning fire. The blaze erupted today in an apartment building in Hemet. Police say the man went back into the burning building to try to save his children. It's a terrible situation. Uh, it, you know, as, as a father myself, going back in would be something that I think a lot of us would probably think about doing and would end up doing, and unfortunately it, it didn't work out in this case. Three other family members were in the apartment at the time. An eight-year-old boy was airlifted to a hospital in grave condition. The conditions of the mother and the infant haven't been released. Investigators are trying to figure out what caused the fire. Some terrifying moments for shoppers this afternoon in Colorado when a shooting took place inside a mall. Officials say a shooting took place inside the town center of Aurora around 4 p.m. local time. Shoppers were told to shelter in place for about 20 minutes until police felt the situation was safe. When officers arrived on the scene, they found one victim who was wounded. The victim was taken to the hospital. Their condition is not known. No other injuries have been reported. Officers said no one is in custody for the shooting. However, officers did not did confirm that the incident was not considered an active shooter situation. This is the second shooting that has taken place in that mall in the month of October, excuse me, in the month of December. Authorities continue to search a heavily wooded area for an Oregon woman missing since Monday. Investigators say a neighbor last saw 20 year old Allison Waterson with her boyfriend Sunday just before noon. They say Allison's boyfriend Benjamin Garland was spotted in a neighbor's truck alone the following morning. Garland's family initially reported Allison missing Monday afternoon, saying the two got separated while hiking, but investigators don't believe the two went hiking in the area at all. That means that there is a delay of about 30 hours from the time that we last known Allison was seen by that homeowner on Sunday around noon until Mr. Garland's family reported her as missing on Monday evening. That delay is concerning to us and we're trying to put together what happened in that intervening time. Garland was arrested Monday evening on unrelated theft charges after authorities found him near a stolen truck. Investigators are asking anyone with information on Allison's disappearance to please call police. On to a first look at weather. NBC 16's Heather Melendez joins us now in the Weather Center. What can we expect this weekend? Well, Alexis, it's going to be a shift in the weather pattern. Right now we're dry, but as 2020 is around the corner, so is the rain. Now let's take a look at those highs today. We did manage to get into the 50s along the coast and upper 40s in the Willamette Valley. And right now temperatures are really cooling down 41 along the coast, and we're starting to see those 30s along the Willamette Valley. But with those cloud coverage today, we're really hanging on tightly to those warmer 
cover conditions. So we're not at below freezing yet. And looking at our satellite radar, we're really seeing those clouds just push on by. Everything's cool, calm, and quiet before that storm arrives. But looking into tomorrow, it is going to be a brisk one. So if you are going to get some coffee for Saturday, definitely reach for that large cup of joe because it is going to be a dry and brisk day. But we do have another chance of rain. I'll let you know all those details in my full weather forecast. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heather. Police are asking for your help. They're trying to identify a man who stole a trailer from a Roseburg U-Haul parking lot. It happened early yesterday morning. The man was caught on surveillance video hooking up a trailer to his white pickup and driving away. He reportedly dumped the trailer in North Roseburg. Um, pulled in, attempted to take one of our 6x12 trailers, and then because he couldn't figure out how to lift it up, uh, switched over to a 4x8, one of our smaller trailers, hooked up and left. Roseburg police found the trailer and returned it to U Haul. They are looking for any information that can help identify the suspect. The capsizing of a boat in Charleston has many talking about the heroic act of a man from the community. NBC 16's Lauren Negretti has a story. This is video Curtis Green took of the Darien Rose. He says it looked like it hit the sandbar, moved away, and started taking on water. The boat with three people on board tumbled under all that weight. Coming, and it just happened too fast. And as soon as the cabin filled with water, and I could see the whites of their eyes, and the water was coming inside, and essentially within moments they would have drowned. The only thing I could think of to do was grab a hammer. Brett, get a hammer. He called to an employee for a hammer and dove in. And so with all my clothes and my hammer on it, it took forever to get out there because for the swimming with a hammer and I finally got to him and I hit it probably 30 times and I just could not get the window to break. The boat shifted and the hammer slid overboard. So now I thought what am I going to do now I don't have a hammer and so that's when I used my hand to break through. And he pulled the people out one by one. Meanwhile the Coast Guard got the call. When we came around the corner we saw four people sitting up on the hull. The survivors with scratches and green in need of stitches were taken to the hospital. There had been three people on the fishing boat. They were trapped inside the wheelhouse at the time of the capsize, and it was full of water, no air pockets. She calls what Green did amazing. They needed help immediately, and he was there, and he jumped right in. Green says he just acted, something he and the Coast Guard say is a testament to the tight-knitted fishing community. Reporting in Coos County, I'm Lauren Negretti. Cleanup underway after that boat capsized in Charleston. Crews pulled crab pots from the water, signs of wreckage from the capsizing. The boat had an estimated 1,200 gallons of diesel fuel on board. Thankfully, officials say it appears very little has leaked out into the water. Looks like a minimal sheen, and if they're able to rewrite the boat, then maybe that won't happen. That's, that's the preventative part. The white booms turned pink from that fuel. The Coast Guard expects the boat to be recovered at low tide tonight. The Oregon Ducks took a break from game prep to take part in a Rose Bowl tradition going back more than a half a century. Brandon Cameron was in Beverly Hills, California for this year's Beef Bowl. Football and meat, something that seems to go together pretty well, and it's actually a tradition that goes back 64 years, 1956, the first Lowry's Beef Bowl. Since then, it's been the two teams pitted against each other that are playing in the Rose Bowl for who could eat the most salad and, more importantly, who could eat the most prime rib. And Oregon senior linebacker Bryson Young, who was the official salad spinner for the event, said he's been thinking about it for a while. But yeah, I've never been here before. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about it. Um, so I, I mean, my mouth's been watering all day. So <laughs> now, as for getting prepared for Wednesday's game, Bryson did admit to us that he asked Coach Cristobal about how much they could eat, and they said no limit. Just go as far as you can. They'll be ready for the game, though. That is the main focus while they're here in Southern California, and I'll have more on that game coming up later in sports. For now, in Beverly Hills, Brandon Cameraman, back to you. Well, speaking of food, coming up next on NBC 16 News at 11, 2020 is quickly approaching, and it's time to start thinking about those health and fitness resolutions. Plus, the start of the new year also marks some changes for musical streaming service Spotify. Monday on NBC 16 Today, a better way to news at 11. The Christmas holiday brought in plenty of delicious sweets and treats. Now it's time for many people to start those New Year's resolutions to lose the pounds. If you're getting a new gym membership, fitness experts say try to keep a routine with going to the gym and don't let your money go to waste. In terms of nutrition, they say stay with something practical that can work. 
there's always going to be ups and downs with fitness and exercise and eat, eating habits. Um, my best advice is to use whatever motivation you can, and New Year's resolution is a good one to use, and stick to it. Tune in on Sunday evening's newscast as Angelina Dixon digs deeper into practical fitness routines that will help you stay committed. New rules go into effect for Oregon bicyclists in 2020. The Senate bill was signed into law in August and takes effect January 1st. Oregon bicyclists won't be required to come to a complete stop at stop signs as long as they yield to the right of way traffic. NBC 16's Christelle Coomway visited a local bike shop to get their take on the new law. Hutch's Bicycle Store is one of the oldest bike shops in town. Assistant manager Jason Oakley says Eugene is a good place for bicyclists. Pretty great cycling infrastructure with bike lanes and bike paths. Um, the community as a whole has really embraced cycling. Also embrace the idea of sharing the road with others. Cyclists are automobiles and we share the same roadway so we have to apply the same rules of the road to the cyclist. But starting in January, a new law will bring a slight change to those rules. In the past, cyclists had to come to a full stop when they got to a stop sign. Now with this new law, they're free to roll on through if it's safe to do so. Oregon cyclists will be able to legally treat every stop sign and flashing red signal as a yield sign. I suspect that it will take a bit of time for both the bicyclists and the automobiles to get used to uh, the expectations. I think ultimately it's still going to take the responsibility of slowing down and looking both ways to make sure you're not going to get plowed into by a car. The new rule is known to many as the Idaho stop. Idaho was the first state to allow it back in 1982. According to a study by UC Berkeley, it reduced bike crashes by 14 percent. I hope that tempers don't flare, but um, if Idaho is any indication, um, I'm hopeful that it will work out and we'll move on to bigger and better things. Only time will tell the effects of this new law being rolled out in Oregon. I'm Christelle Kumi reporting. Oregon is the fourth state to enact such law. Idaho, Delaware, and Arkansas have also passed their own versions. A collaboration of organizations is offering cheap rides this New Year's Eve. The goal of the campaign is to stop people from getting behind the wheel after a night of drinking. NBC 16's Alex Hossenstab has a story. On New Year's Eve, as community members flock to local watering holes like Shooters in Eugene, bartenders are on alert, making sure patrons get home safely. It's definitely part of the job. If you noticed any signs of intoxication, you find out if they're driving, and then you would most definitely help out uh, getting them a car ride home. But Ciders says one thing that could have people second-guessing calling a cab or Uber is the price. And the cabs especially, very expensive. So she was happy to hear about a collaboration of local organizations in Eugene and Springfield taking part in this year's Safe Rides Home campaign. And I will be working that evening and I will definitely tell them, let them know ahead of time. Initiated by the Technology Association of Oregon, the campaign aims to prevent drunk driving. This campaign is really about helping the community being able to enjoy New Year's and that really begins with getting to and from your event safely. New this year, LTD will be offering free bus rides on their normal routes from 5 until midnight. But as most New Year's Eve festivities go past midnight, Uber and Oregon Taxi are are offering reduced fare as part of the promotion. You can take the bus to your event and then utilize Uber Oregon Taxi to get your way home. There is a $5 discount on Uber rides and a $10 discount on Oregon Taxi rides. Money can be a barrier and then they worry about leaving their car overnight. We are hoping that we'll encourage people to choose this option instead of driving. Cider says it's a weight off the shoulders of bartenders. It's like less of a concern for everybody going out and enjoying their, their night out. Offering cheaper options options and safer options this New Year's Eve. I'm Alex Hossenstab reporting. Shipping companies are preparing for millions of people to return all those Christmas gifts they didn't like. In fact, January 2nd could be the biggest day ever for holiday gift returns. Several shipping companies have dubbed it National Returns Day. UPS expects a record 1.9 million packages to be returned next Thursday. That's a 26% increase from one year earlier. And that prediction is just for UPS and does not include packages sent through the Postal Service or FedEx. UPS expects the record numbers because January 2nd is the first work day of the new year. The company also said many people buy online with the intention of returning the product if they don't like it.
Spotify is staying out of politics in 2020. The music streaming service announced today it will no longer accept political ads in 2020. Spotify says it doesn't have the ability to quote reasonably validate the ads. The political ads will no longer play in its ad supported tier for music streaming and in its original and exclusive podcast. This does not include ads embedded within third party content. For instance, podcasts not owned by Spotify. The policy only affects its service in the U.S. because that's the only market where it sells political ads. Turning to weather now, NBC 16 Heather Melendez is standing by for the what's coming up in your full forecast. Heather? Well, we're dry for now, but we do have rain just around the corner. I'll give you your New Year's Eve forecast coming up. Some things just can't last forever. Like Melendez. Well, now that 2019 is coming to a close, so too are dry conditions. Here's a time lapse of Eugene. We really saw some overcast skies today, but that didn't change Mother Nature to really shift the pattern. We did see some sunshine peek through and really warm up those conditions for us here in the Pacific Northwest, and that's going to continue for tomorrow. We will start to see some dry and cloudy conditions for our Saturday, but by the evening time, we will see a slight chance of rain as Sunday will predominantly be a rainy day, and then we'll start to see some more rain for the new year as that heads in. Now looking at our satellite radar right now, it's the calm before the storm. Conditions are just really quiet and calm for the night and will continue until tomorrow. But for our lows today, we are managing to at least be mid to low 40s. Definitely warmer than what we were yesterday and looking for tomorrow's sidewalk forecast. We will be dry for the most part for tonight into tomorrow, but again, we will start to see some moisture push in and here's why. Looking at our weather forecast, our next weather maker is this cold front starting to push in in the late evening. This is Saturday morning. Right now, conditions will be cloudy for the most part for your Saturday morning. But as the evening rolls on by, this cold front really starts to kick in by 8 o'clock. And as the clock moves, that cold front, that low pressure system really starts to move in Northern California, bringing in plentiful rainfall for us Sunday. And then for Monday, we start to get a break with that high pressure system, just really drying out those conditions for all of Western Oregon. Again, and looking at our model forecast, we can really see this more precisely by 8 a.m. on Saturday. We will start to just see some cloud coverage for us in the Western Oregon region. And as the clock moves, we start to see that pressure move in. We start to see some rainfall by 8 o'clock, some light sprinkles. But as the evening time turns into morning by Sunday, everyone will see widespread rain. Now looking at our future cast moving through for our rain totals for Sunday. We will see at least a quarter of an inch along the Willamette Valley to at least almost half an inch along the coast. So the rain totals aren't as drastic as we were last week, but we still will see plenty of rain into the new year. Now looking at our forecast for Saturday, we will start to see some warmer conditions, 50s along the coast and along the Willamette Valley for your seven day forecast in Eugene. We will see some cloudy conditions for Saturday. Last day to get some dry conditions before Sunday. That rain system will move in and then on Monday and brief break before that New Year's Eve rain. Now conditions will be moderate. We'll have some mild 40s, mid 40s for you for the week. And for our coastal area, we will start to get some cloud coverage for a Saturday. On Sunday, we will see some rain as well. A brief break on Monday and then by New Year's, we will start to get some rain. And then looking into the Roseburg and Quaw Valley region, you will start to see some plentiful sunshine on Saturday, some rain on Sunday, a brief break on Monday, and then really tons of rain for your tail end of the week. Conditions will be at or above average for you and really just bringing in that rain for that new year. Well, I guess I have Monday to look forward to. Nobody never really looks forward to Monday. I know. Monday. It's a great Monday. It's, it's going to be sunny for everybody. Right. Well, thank you so much, Heather. And coming up next in sports, Oregon has faced some incredible talent throughout the season, but they may face their toughest challenge in the Rose Bowl. Another report from Los Angeles is ahead.
paid the price. You paid too much. Speaking matchups in this Rose Bowl, but perhaps none more prominent than Oregon's top 10 nationally ranked defense versus one of the best running backs in Wisconsin history, one of the best running backs in NCAA history in Jonathan Taylor, who is just 91 yards away from becoming only the third player in FBS history to have multiple 2,000 yard seasons. He's a great player and he causes a whole lot of problems for this really talented Ducks defense. You just got to pursue to the ball and you got a gang tackle. Um, he's a running back that that is special in so many ways. Um, I think he's like what top five in the nation in broken tackles. Uh, his offensive line blocks very good for him. So it's just like we got to make sure to get off blocks. We got to make sure to gang tackle and not not let go at any moment and hold on for dear life because if you don't it's bad because he's fast too. People don't know that he was a high school cha state champion in the hundred. So it's not like he's just some running back that doesn't have speed. He's fast and he's strong. So we just got to be able to stop that. What could be problematic for the Wisconsin offense is all the multiples that Oregon's defense presents. They do a lot of different things and that can be confusing for a team that is mostly unfamiliar with them as this Badgers team is. But it is the last game of the season. The Badgers have seen a lot of really talented defenses, so they feel like they're prepared for Oregon's unique defense. I feel like they do a good job of being able to, to get off of blocks whenever you think that your your blockers might have them. They're, they're great with their hands. They're able to swipe, chop the hands down, uh, and really, really, really able to maneuver with the hands. They got great athletes. They got size. Um, I think they do an outstanding job of getting off blocks and tackling in space, uh, which probably reflects why they're so good and the numbers are so good behind them. So today was all about Wisconsin's offense versus Oregon's defense. On Sunday, we'll get to hear from Oregon's offense going against another talented defense in Wisconsin. Both sides expecting this to be a physical game. In Los Angeles, Brandon Cameron, back to you. Thank you so much, Brandon. Coming up next on NBC 16 News at 11, scientists are puzzled by the behavior of what used to be one of the brightest stars in the sky. What they have to say about the strange occurrence. The Ducks have migrated south to Pasadena, and so has NBC. And finally tonight, the red giant star called Betelgeuse has been rapidly dimming since October. It used to be the ninth brightest object you can see from Earth, but it's now more than two times fainter than usual. Scientists believe that could be a prelude to its explosion, turning the star into a so-called supernova. But it's anyone's guess when that will happen. Some scientists believe it could still be more than 200,000 years away. Whether it happens, it will be a spectacular sight to see in the sky, but it will not pose any danger to any life on Earth. However, some scientists believe the dimming is just a phase and there is no supernova in the making at all. You know, I have to tell you, Alexis, I follow a ton of science accounts like do NASA. You? I do. And I was reading that in five billion years, we are expected, the sun is expected to at least burn the helium process, start the burning process, and it's going to turn into a giant red star. Well, that sounds fascinating, and we will definitely have to talk more about that. <laughs> you have to, like, break it down to me in kindergarten terms, because all of that is just, like, over my head. <laughs> but speaking of what we can expect in the sky, with yes. one more last look at weather, what can we expect? Absolutely. Well, here in Eugene, we can at least expect one more day of drier conditions with some cloudy skies for us for our Saturday. By the evening time, around 8 o'clock, we will see a chance of showers moving on in because for Sunday, we're going to see tons of rainfall. On Monday, we will get a brief break, but then as the new year comes, we will get some rain. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for watching NBC 16 News at 11. The Tonight Show starring Jenny Fallon is next. Can my side be firm? My super soft.